bring this down my level for a moment. Um, I'd like to thank you and, and welcome you all here for our annual meeting. Um, especially I'd like to welcome some special guests. We have our speaker this evening, Commissioner Chris Cook, who's with us. So we're very excited to be here. I'd also like to welcome Councillor Zakum, who's at the back of the room, and Senator Brownsberger. Um, many of you received the minutes of our annual meeting for April the 11th in 2018, so I'd like to have a motion, please, to approve those minutes. So moved. So moved. Okay, so second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any abstentions? Denials? No? Thank you. Those are moved. Um, I'd like to welcome you tonight. It's always so exciting for me to have an opportunity to come to our annual meeting and, and see our members. Um, the parks that we care for are so incredibly special and important to our city. Um, and the work that we do, we're passionate about. But we couldn't do what we do without all of you. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your support. Um, April is our membership month, and pretty much all of our feedback uh, tells us that word of mouth is one of the most important ways that people get to know about us and, and join. Um, so I'd like to ask you, uh, as you interact with friends and neighbors and colleagues, uh, that you might think to invite them to, uh, to join us in our, in our mission in caring for these parks. Um, the other person I'd like to say a, a big thank you to is Linda Cox, who's with us. She's our chair of our Legacy Society, which is a group of our members who have remembered the friends in their will uh, through uh, planned giving. So for those of you, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'm sure Linda would be happy to talk to you a, a, about that after. Um, that's Linda right there. Um, and it is all about all of you and members. And um, I'm constantly uh, excited in my role as I represent the Friends, um, meeting people throughout our city and as I travel, talking about what the Friends does. You know, so many times people will say, well, I thought the city did that. And, um, and the city does a lot. Um, but, you know, the Friends has really, I think, done transformative work uh, in making those parks great and those spaces uh, really truly world-class. Um, one of the things I'm very excited about is that um, at 49 and a half years old, we are very close um, to formalizing our agreement with the City of Boston in our pri private public partnership. And I can't tell you how excited I am about that. So, and Chris has really been to the forefront of helping us with that, so thank you, Chris. Um, but that will be some news we will share with you as soon as the ink is dry. But I'm pretty excited. Um, the other thing that your voices do is, um, you know, you share and talk about what's important to you, and you make sure that we are aware of that, that the city is aware of that. And one of the great thank yous that I have to give all of you um, this year was on the advocacy around the Freedom Rally. Um, as you probably saw, we were fortunate enough that the city hosted, our city councilor helped us host uh, a public meeting, which I think was very helpful. And you may have seen the story that um, the Freedom Rally has been permitted for one day on the park. Um, and so we are thrilled and pleased and could not have done it without all of your support and voices. So thank you very much for that. And as I say, we are 49 and a half years old. Um, we are about to be 50, and that's pretty exciting. Um, so please stay tuned. We have started some very exciting discussions about how we honor that, that legacy. Uh, and we talk about the 50 years, but we talk about the next 50 years more importantly. So thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over in just a moment to Kate Enroth. Um, and I just would love to share that in the days leading up to today's meeting, a new member who I met at a dinner party, and I said, this is a great group, um, sent me five Every day I got a beautiful card, uh, a historic card about our, our park. So, thank you. <laughs> With that, Kate and Governance. Thank you, Leslie. So the 
Governance Committee of the Friends of the Public Garden recommends the election of the following persons to the Board of Directors for a three-year term, term beginning in March 2019. That is Alexandra Hastings, Beatrice Nesson, and Margaret Picorni. So I'd like to ask for a motion, please, to support um, the government rec the governance recommendation. Thank you. Second. Oh, second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much, and congratulations to the governors, the directors. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm uh, delighted to report that the Friends is in very strong financial position and the reason largely is all of you. Uh, we've had extraordinary gifts this year and uh, that has allowed us, I hope you look at the sheet here, gives the details, but everything is up, up, up and uh, that doesn't happen uh, without all of you. So on behalf of the financial side of the, I echo Leslie's thanks to you all. It means that next year, or the year we're actually in now, 2019, our budget uh, for the first time is over three million dollars and at least two million of dollars of those will go directly into caring for the parks and programs that we put on. So that's very exciting for us. We have a very ambitious agenda. And so, once again, thank you for letting us do all these wonderful things. And that's really all I have to say. It's all, it's all in here. Um, and uh, I'll be around if anybody has any questions. Uh, if you look at this, I'll do my best to try to answer it. But um, due to the support of uh, years past, we have an endowment that is uh, holding its own. Uh, beating our benchmarks, and uh, that, as you can see, provides a, an important part of our income, but by far the most important is our support from all of you. And now, Lizzie's our executive director, is going to tell you a bit about how we're going to spend all that money. <laughs> and how we did spend the money. So, happy spring plus a week. It's wonderful to see all of you here. It's a great opportunity to um, tell you again, as Bill said, how we're spending our money and why it's so important to be supporting the Friends, both for, with funding dollars as well as advocate voices. So it was a busy one for the Friends, investing $1.9 million this last year in parks care and programming, and next year our budget is $2.4 million for that same category of parks care and programming is 27% more than 2018, and it's twice what we spent in 2013. So think about that. And it's because you've made it possible for this, to, for this to happen. So thank you so much for that. We are an essential partner with the city. Um, and it shows out in the parks. And as uh, Leslie said, we're almost 50 years old and we're having a moment to formalize this relationship. So we are thrilled to be tying the knot with the city. It will make us each more accountable to one another and be even more integrated in our teamwork out in the parks, which is so important to get the good work done. As in years past, we planted, we pruned, we removed, we treated for disease control hundreds of trees. This is a really important part of the work we do. The, the great majority of that money, the, the large portion of that money, is to care for the living systems in the park. The things that make a park a park, the trees, the turf, and the soils. This year's focus has been increasing the care we give to the soils underneath the trees. Mulching, fertilizing, applying micronutrients. I've said this before and I'll have to say it again because our team of Norm Healy, who's our consulting arborist and soil scientist, and his wife, Chris Healy, do amazing work out in the parks. Norm told us recently that there's a, a, re a new word for this, biofortification. <laughs> so we are providing resiliency to these uh, living beings that live amongst us and that we love so much. And it's, it costs a lot of money to do that. So that's a really important part of this work. And in terms of the turf, it's really important to care for that carpet that is um, the ground of our common living room. It's, uh, these parks are used from between seven and 10,000 people daily. 
and tens of thousands for um, special events. This is the Women's March of two years ago. This picture is a day after the Patriots rally. There was a perfect storm of Still warm... Like <laughs> Still looks like that is true. <laughs> so it was a perfect storm of really warm weather, a million and a half people, and turf that was not strong enough to resist this kind of love and this kind of battering, I would have to say. So this is our goal, to strengthen turf. And we, this, is, this is the beginning of a diagram. You'll be seeing these on the website, but these are plants. Every blade of grass is a grass plant. And what you see above ground happens below ground. And we need as much root depth as we have above ground. Now, if we mow too short, we get less root depth. And if we don't get the right amount of soil um, warmth through sun, we have trees of grass that are stressed. And if there's a lot of compaction and not remediation from that, they're stressed. So one of the things we want to do is help all of you and all of us understand what it takes for turf and trees to grow in our loved, intensively used urban green spaces. This will be the third year of caring for all 17 systems of irrigation in the three parks. We're very excited because this year we're installing smart irrigation systems in the public garden and on all nine blocks of the mall. And why is it smart? It's smart because there are sensors in the ground, water sensors, that tells the system whether to turn on or not. We tested this system two years ago, and in one month, in one panel of the garden, we saved 44,000 gallons of water because it was a wet month, and the sensors told the irrigation, don't turn on, we don't need you. So it also means we're going to be conserving water and preventing, hopefully lessening, the uh, risk of waterborne diseases because some of our trees get too much water and some don't get enough. So. Uh, look out for the, uh, an improved irrigation system in both of these parks. We're very excited about this. With the support of the Joan and Henry Lee Sculpture Endowment, which many of you supported, and thank you so much, we did a lot of work on this level in the parks, sculpture conservation. This is the Founders Memorial in the Common. We also cared for the Soldiers and Sailors on the Common, the George Washington and Chinese Lantern in the um, Garden, and the Women's Memorial Mall. And this uh, memorial turned 15 this year. It is a loved memorial. People hang out at it. Dogs frequent it. And it needs to be regularly cared for. <laughs> we also this year partnered with the Lend a Hand Society, which was founded by um, Edward Everett Hale, who you see here. We restored his terrace this year. We got a wonderful support from uh, a couple that have uh, adopted Edward Everett Hale. Love him. Meet him and visit him every day. And his organization, the lend hand Society, was celebrating their 125th anniversary last year. So we partnered with them for an event to celebrate him, his life, and his monument. And here is a younger Hale reenactor telling us about why he thinks it's so important to be philanthropic in the city. This is an exciting project. I'm sorry that our board member and Commonwealth Avenue Wall Chair, Margaret Picorni, is not in town to uh, hear us say that after 30 years, and maybe more, it could be even 40 years, we, were finally, we finally solved the problem of lighting the sculptures on the wall, which is very exciting. This is our first that we'll be lighting, the uh, Samuel Elliott Morrison, many people's favorite monument. The columns and the garrison will follow. So Leslie did say we're uh, celebrating our 50th uh, anniversary next year. That we're excited about this being a project that we can tout and celebrate finally having these pools of darkness, which you see on the light, and the left being pools of light. And you have heard and read about our work on the Shaw 54th Memorial, working with the city and with the National Park Service. We are restoring it, we are removing it from the plaza level up, and why? Because in 2015, our stone conservator noticed that there were some stones that were displaced, and there were some stress fractures starting to occur in the bronze, so we decided to pull aside a stone and saw that the foundation was brick and is deteriorating. It's not going to fall down right now, but it could, a seismic event could have it on Beacon Street. And it's really important to be, uh, create a strong foundation under this monument and also shore up the plaza, we waterproof the plaza. So this is $2.8 million. Half of that money is coming from the National Park Service, which is wonderful. It means that they are the lead uh, 
project um, team member, it also means that the government shutdown impacted our timing. So we were hoping to start this earlier than we can. We expect to be uh, beginning this restoration work at the end of July. But we also have partnered with the Museum of African American History because this is a great opportunity not just to fix a piece of, st of sculpture, but to talk about what it means. What, who were the 54th? What were they fighting for? How are we doing today with the issues of race, justice, and equality? How many of you were um, at Tremont Temple on January 9th for our community conversation? Great. It was an incredible evening, 500 people, of which many of you were there. I'm so glad to see that. Um, having the voices of activism, art, and history talking about the power of public monuments and why they matter. It was a great conversation. We were so thrilled, and actually WGBH came and filmed it, so people who weren't there, you can go on our website and, and see it. Another event will be, the next event will be the um, celebration of the removal of the monument on July 10th. So um, put that down in your book, 1030, and we will be uh, sort of marching off a couple pieces of the monument, and then the rest of it will follow. So we're in our 32nd, I think it is, year of the uh, Rose Brigade. How many Rose Brigaders are here? All right, <laughs> that's great. Um, this has been an amazing volunteer effort of love. Uh, China Altman has been the inspiring uh, leader of this ever since it began, and Carl Foster, who you see here, has the last several years been her co-leader. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to be out in the garden and also be seen doing things. We are so often invisible in our work. You know, we can spend a half a million dollars and people don't know it, but every Wednesday you will know that we're out there because these folks are there. And if you want to just walk in, Chris did that one day, one or two years ago, they will give you a pair of gloves and pruners and help you understand how to do it, but they will welcome you in to do that work. So please, uh, I encourage you to do it. We have a younger sister organization, group, uh, the Border Brigade. They're in their fourth or fifth year. Now, it's the fourth year, caring for the borders in the garden, the uh, Royalson Street and Beacon Street borders. That happens on Thursdays. We're about to kick off our eighth year on Brewer Plaza. This is a wonderful, transformative uh, project that we did eight years ago, nine years ago, where the city took the lead in restoring the fountain, and then we expanded that project to be restoration of the landscape and activating it. It is a place where it's hard to get a place to sit in the summer on a beautiful day at lunchtime. So you're starting to see the umbrellas come up already. The uh, coordinators will be there in about a week. And by mid-April, when it's warm enough to play a piano, that the uh, Berkeley Jazz students will be out there playing. Last year, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of this amazing piece of sculpture. It was the first piece of public art that landed on the common. And we had a great day celebrating it. We had a proclamation from the mayor declaring it Brewer Fountain Day. Yeah. And here's our, <laughs> our fearless leader declaring it's, it's Brewer Fountain Day. It was really fun and wonderful. And you see those four kids behind Chris? Those are um, Quincy School students, fifth grade students, and the whole class wrote poems about the fountain, and these four kids read their poems. It was very sweet. They were very serious about it. It was adorable. So it was such a successful day. We're gonna have a launch of the plaza summer every year. So put June 20th on your calendar. We'll be out there, free food, free cookies, and a lot of fun, hopefully no rain. So another cute event. <laughs> So Jonathan, this is Jonathan's second year, he decided that he was going to be the leader of the parade. I mean, he takes this thing really seriously, and he was so adorable. <laughs> Michael, the policeman, he's pu pulling a, um, a toy of, of the ducklings behind him. It was just amazing. <laughs> so we expect and hope Jonathan will be back. And this is Mother's Day, so all of you who have little ducklings, um, grandchildren, children, friends, Comment and enjoy this day. It's just a wonderful event. This event, we started at our 40th anniversary. It's Making History on the Common. <clears throat> this is our 10th year of this. It is a, an immersive history experience for children from the third to the fifth grade in from Boston schools. There are now a 1,000 kids signed up for it. It'll be the first Monday in June. Kids are coming from Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, the North End, Roslindale, East Boston, all throughout Boston. This last year, it was literally a Northeaster, <laughs> but still 500 kids showed up. 
they had a wonderful time. We partnered with Freedom Trail Foundation, Historic New England, the Wampanoag, singers and dancers, so they learn about the life of this park from thousands of years ago to the current day. We talk about protest, you know, what does a protest need and why would you do it? And what do you need to pro what, what's something in your life that you'd like to protest for? So um, it's a really enriching day, and I encourage anybody that has time on the first Monday in June to come in and experience this. We are in our fifth year of tours, and uh, two dozen tour guys are coming back to do this work. Thanks to Shirley Smith and Shirley, you're here. Thank you so much as well as to Sydney Kenyon for making this program possible. Um, people should go on this tour. It's about 500 people, and I see some, uh, who are, who's a docent and a tour guide in the, in the Okay, there you are, thank you. Um, we call it the untold stories of the public garden because even people that live here all their life and go through this garden every day learn something new. So we encourage you to come and learn something new about this park. Advocacy has been central to the work of the Friends from the beginning. We have needed to advocate against misuse, overuse, it's the threat of a developing city. It's important and wonderful that we have economic growth and development, but these are small and fragile green spaces, and we need to advocate for the balance between growth and protection. So, as you know, we had um, a chapter with Winthrop Square, and we are beyond that chapter, but we had two outcomes from that, two really good outcomes. One is a master plan for the Boston Common to look at how we should be spending the $28 million that's coming to that park, five of which is in a maintenance fund, 23 of which will be capital money. So we're working very closely with the Parks Department to work together to choose a, a team, which we're very excited about. It's going to be a very robust, as we say, but it really will be a robust public process. We want to hear from everybody that walks through this park. They will be accosted <laughs> when they're in the park. We'll have park presence days. We'll have a strong social media presence as well as, as conventional public meetings. So, it's going to be really important for all of you to be part of this too. How can you reinvent and re-envision America's public oldest park and uh, the center stage of our civic life? How can it do it? an even better job in the, in the era to come? It's a once in a generation opportunity. The other thing that we uh, advocated for and is being done is downtown planning. It's really important to have uh, predictability in development. Everybody needs that, including developers. And uh, we need to not be fighting one building at a time. So we need to see what the future is. It's going to be a denser city. There will be density downtown, but we don't, we cannot um, lose the, the protection and the uh, importance of these parks in densification of downtown. So we, Beatrice Nesson, our chair of the Common Committee, is on the Citizens Advisory Committee, and we look forward to having that process be a, a fruitful one. In everything we do, we work closely with the Parks Department. It's really important that we join hands. We, certainly advocate, but many, many times we're out there together doing the work that needs to be done here. We also advocate for their budget. They get more capital funds, but the really, really important money is operations. This is less sexy, but really important money that we need to fight for. And we also need to thank them. I said this before, but please don't feel shy about thanking somebody that's planting the tools for next year, that's mowing the lawn, that's shoveling and doing whatever needs to be done to keep your parks in wonderful condition. It's really important that we let them know we care about that. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Parks Commissioner and Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space, Chris Cook. Chris was appointed commissioner in 2014, and he's been a wonderful partner for us. Last June, he was elevated to chief, responsible for leading the cabinet and achieving his mission of enhancing the quality of life in Boston by protecting air, water, climate, and land resources, and preserving and improving the integrity of Boston's architectural and historic resources, a tall and very important order for which he is the right person. And I'm going to try and make this happen. Chris, I know you have your PowerPoint on here. So I'm going to pull it up. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, I don't know how to use it. <laughs> so, I'm to do this. Is that there? Oh, yeah. That's, that's the one, right? Well, 
you know, it may be, you want to use the uh, yeah. clicker, this oh. is the guy. <laughs> All right. There you go. So this is why we have partners. The city of Boston has partners. Because you can't let the city kids out of City Hall. Uh, it's very good to see all of you. Uh, congratulations. I, I wrote congratulations on your uh, 49th year, but congratulations on your 49th and a half year. Um, thank you very much, Leslie. Thank you very much, Liz. Very grateful to be here. Uh, of course, again, I, I just want to add to the chorus of thank yous um, to, uh, and I know uh, Rep. Jay Livingstone's joined us too, if we give him a round of applause. Senator Brown's here, thank you, Senator. Um, and of course, a huge round of applause for Councillor Zakem. Uh, yes. The councillor announced recently, uh, this is the part we all go, ah, that he won't be running for re-election. He, he's just been a fantastic uh, stalwart supporter of our parks, uh, and especially your parks. <laughs> and uh, just, I'm just very grateful for everything he's, he's done for me. I thought it'd be important, uh, I'm gonna talk for the next 10 or 15 minutes, so just about some uh, movements that we see in national parks and how they relate to our park system here in Boston. And the reason that I was going to talk about it is that I think it's important to keep all of these ideas in our mind as we approach our master plan. As Liz said, we do have a once in a generation opportunity to really revitalize Boston Common and make it the best version of itself that it can be. And so I think it would be a mistake to not look beyond ourselves, but even look beyond our neighborhood and just see what's happening in, in the rest of the city and in the rest of the country and throughout the world and see, are there opportunities to learn? Um, are there best practices that we incorporate? One thing that's really important that Liz stressed uh, is the management of Boston Common. You know, so much of its history, just its program, what's in it, uh, the different amenities, the different sculptures, the way it's taken care of, has just happened in an ad hoc basis. I mean, there was no plan, there was, there was attempts, you know, there was a management plan that was developed in the 80s that the Boston Parks Department ignored for most of the time. Um, that, you know, I would thumb through from time to time. But this is, a, this is an opportunity to hit the reset switch on the park and really have it be its best version of itself. And it's important to do that because the park's only going to get busier. Uh, there's only going to be more people using it. And so we have to be really judicious about the way we take care of it and the way we, uh, the way we, um, program it. Uh, 49 years is incredible. I just want to recognize how difficult that work. You know, it's like dog years. 49 years is like 490 years. Uh, park advocacy is really difficult, <coughs> nose to the grindstone work. I mean, you just heard that <laughs> Margaret Picorni and others have been at trying to light sculptures for 30 years. I mean, that's probably too long. Uh, <laughs> It was easier to light the trees than it was to light the sculptures. Um, it, it, it's just really important work. And unless, unless we forget that it's important work, I think we take for granted that we are living in an era where parks, and especially urban parks, are very celebrated. Um, that's not always the case, and it won't always be the case. So there will be a point, I know you said everything's going up and up and up, and that's great. And I would say that everything's going up and up and up in park advocacy as well, but there are pendulum swings, and it's important, and there are people in this room who remember uh, times that were not as good as this. And so I think we have to guard against us at that. And I'm gonna close uh, my comments when it comes time uh, with sort of a call to, to really rethink the advocacy as, as well as we think of the master plan. Um, the reason the work is difficult is because uh, urban parks presents a dynamic set of challenges because the setting itself is so dynamic. Cities change. The populace and their needs change, their desires change, certainly resources ebb and flow. One constant, however, is that it seems like the demand on these spaces increases every single year, and that's certainly the case with our treasured landmark Boston Common. And in so many ways, I think this is the central work of what we're going to be navigating with the master plan, is we are going to have to navigate competing interests, and we're going to have to look at them as opportunities to collaborate. Can we look at these challenges 
as opportunities to collaborate and really make the best out of some of these, uh, these voices. And so to not look at a problem as an either or, but look, look at it as a yes and, or a yes because, or a yes why, or a yes but. And I think there's opportunities there, and I think we can collaborate on some of these challenges. Um, when possible, it's important to look at these decision points as collaborative challenges, but it's also important to recognize that these days, we're asking a lot of our parks and our park systems, and that's not only true in Boston, but throughout the country. So to give an extreme example of that, I just wanted to highlight uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, really quickly. The Michael Van Valkenburg Design Gathering Place is charged with nothing less than bending a city. I quote from the New York Times, if it succeeds as its founders and community leaders hope, it can bring families together and help mend a city with a legacy of segregation where many neighborhoods grapple with poverty, health disparities, and the isolating effects of urban renewal. Tulsa has a long history of social inequality, Mr. Van Valkenburg observed. There's hardly a better way to bring people together than in a democratic space like a park. And this is what Boston Common has always been, you know? And so you read some of these quotes and you say, my God, can a park actually heal a city? Can a park actually achieve these goals? But I think we see these goals in our parks. And unless we think this is too heady, and this is too ambitious for a park design. We have to remember, we're Boston Park aficionados, so we have to remember our Olmstead here. I'll give you an Olmstead quote talking about Central Park and Prospect Park. This is an off-quoted Olmstead quote. All classes largely represented with a common purpose, not at all intellectual, competitive with none, disposing to jealousy and spiritual or intellectual pride toward none, each individual adding by his mere presence to the pleasure of all others, all helping to the greater happiness of each. He literally could be talking about Brewer Fountain, right? I mean, this is the intersection of the city where people come out of the tea station and for one brief moment, everyone's just happy because water is being introduced into their life. There's music playing. There's a seat to sit down and scarf down some banh mi, which is fantastic. But there's just an opportunity to take a break from the hustle bustle, but not be alone. To be together, to heal, to connect with nature. I think, I think it's important to recognize that Tulsa is no more ambitious than the father of landscape architecture. And the friends of the public garden are no more in ambitious than the father of landscape architecture, but rather the friends of the public garden. You all recognize a fundamental truth that we as humans are happiest when we are together and connected by nature. The urban park is what brings us together and connects us to nature. It is what makes us happiest, all of us. This is fundamental to cities, and this is why urban parks matter. It's why your advocacy matters. And it's important to remember as we head into the master plan, that's the core. That's what we need to celebrate as we move into the master planning of Boston Common. Our common, concerts, road races, dog walkers, skating, splashing, sunbathing, sunscreen, softball, frisbee, Quidditch, <laughs> veterans events, and so much more. All of Boston, all of Boston is on display on the common seemingly all of the time. You know, all our foibles are out there. All our blemishes are out there. All the best parts of us are out there. The common is everything to everybody all the time. How do you design a park to succeed at that? Good luck, Gene and Cherry at Weston and Sampson. It's going to be fantastic work, I'm sure. But that's what it has to be. It has to be that aspirational. We're not going to get another opportunity like that. Parks connect us, and parks that are better connected are better for cities. Now, I, I do want to transition a little bit because I think Boston Common plays a central role in the completion of the Emerald Necklace. You know, we had a great period of development in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, but it is a time to rekindle the connecting that we have and the opportunity for connection that we have in the city of Boston. So as you look to Chicago and you look at projects like the 606 
The Trust for Public Land worked with the community and partners to create the 606, and they transformed nearly three miles of unused rail line in the elevated Bloomingdale Trail. This is much like the High Line in New York City. And set above city streets and the park and the trail systems include elevated trails for bikers and runners and walkers. And unlike Boston Common, the bikers aren't hitting the walkers. The walkers are bumping into the bikers. They got it all planned out. And according to TPL's website, the 606 connects parks, people, and communities. What, what's once, what once physically separated those communities now knits them together. Now, connected parks are central to Boston's green identity. However, it's important to realize that our work is not yet finished. The Emerald Necklace isn't finished. With our partners at Emerald Necklace Conservancy, Franklin Park Coalition, we are more than committed to the nine Olmstead parks and beyond. To date, uh, Mayor Martin J. Walsh has dedicated nearly $40 million of capital investment to those parks alone, including $5 million worth of pathway work at Franklin Park. And you can see the great runners at the Boston Half Marathon enjoying those pathways. And $4 million of restoration in Jamaica Ponds pathways. Combined with $6 million worth of capital investment in the common and the public garden before the $23 million of the master plan, we are striving for excellence in our linear park system. These are historic improvements in our historic parks. However, that system needs to go further. We are going to ask a lot of our parks. In 1897, the Olmsted Corporation developed a vision for the Emerald Necklace continuing up Columbia Road to South Boston, connecting communities in our urban core to the water. Today, portions of Columbia Road more closely resemble a highway than a parkway. Parking and transit are all concerns when redesigning roads but so is livability and access. Upham's Corner in Dorchester is only a 20 minute walk to the sea, but it feels so much further. Imagine if children on Geneva Ave could take a short, safe, tree-lined bike ride to this. Last week, we unveiled our vision for Moakley Park. During the time of the development of the Olmsted Corporation's vision for completing the Emerald Necklace, this space didn't even exist. It was still being transformed from tidal salt marshes. Currently disconnected from DCR's Carson Beach by Day Boulevard, our plan would eventually unite these spaces while creating height within the park and protect the recreational spaces from both stormwater and coastal flooding. Additional stormwater protection would be provided by floodable spaces like basketball courts. Perhaps most important, this design helps protect residents from a 1% storm through 2070 projections. Mowgli Park is surrounded on two sides by public housing. It is about equity and it's about access. And as this project demonstrates, urban parks are now part of our global strategy for climate adaptation and Boston Common needs to be part of that strategy as well. And that's why it's so important the work that the Friends of the Public Garden are undertaking with things like the smart irrigation systems, making sure that we're not wasting water, making sure that the grass lasts longer, that we're not wasting energy. Because we all think that we just turn on the tap and the quabbin will keep coming. But there is a future where we have to deal with water the same way that the rest of our country deals with water. I want to I want to note that Moakley Park and this vision is part of the mayor's vision for a resilient Boston Harbor. This transformative vision that will invest in Boston's waterfront to protect the city's residents, homes, jobs, and infrastructure against the impacts of rising sea level and climate change, this plan lays out strategies along the 47-mile shoreline that will increase access and open space to the waterfront while protecting the city during a major flooding event. We wouldn't even have the option to think about a plan like this if it wasn't for park advocates if it wasn't for people like Vivian Lee fighting for the Harbor Walk year after year after year, we wouldn't even have the ability to transform this into something that we could adapt for climate change. While this is an exciting vision, it can be combined with the careful planning and create a more fully realized emerald necklace. As you move into South Boston from Columbia Road, residents and visitors can travel to the amazing beaches of South Boston or you can continue to Four Point Channel 
where Martins Park, a climate-ready, universally accessible playground, is finishing construction. Boston Common is only a 10-minute walk from here. It's a little bit longer if you stop to smell the roses at Post Office Square or the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Think about how close we are to having a city completely connected by parks. We have to connect the dots. Granted, they're super expensive dots. <laughs> but we have to connect these dots. There's so many co-benefits to this work. Park advocacy definitely matters. We envision a city that everyone has access, equal access, to a high quality park. We were really proud of the Trust for Public Land and the National Recreation Parks Association and the Urban Land Institute recognized us as, a, as only the second city where 100% of our residents live within a 10 minute walk to a park. However, that doesn't tell the full story. Not all those parks are great. And so we have to invest in them in a different way. And so we're striving for something called Parks First, which is about access, equity, and excellence. We want to make sure that residents have access to a good park, but we want to make sure there's an equity in how we fund those parks, how we take par care of those parks, and we want to make sure that they have excellence, especially in preparing for climate yeah. adaptation. Climate change, equity, access. It'd be one thing to stop at just a 10 minute walk, but we're going beyond that. Just last year alone, we added a new parcel in Rosendale, where there used to be a vacant lot, it's now a pocket park. We've created the Stephen Odom Serenity Garden in Mattapan. And in Grove Hall, we're turning a parking lot into a public space for kids. We've got to go beyond a 10 minute walk. We've got to make sure that all these green spaces are connected. And where they can't be connected by actual linear parks, we have to make sure that we have livable streets connecting them. So the kids are always experiencing nature, so that our residents are always experiencing nature because we are happiest when we are connected to nature. We ask so much of our parks, the climate change, the equity, the access, and since, and since 1634, all of these issues have been on display at Boston Common. This is by far my favorite day at Boston Common. This was the start of it before the crowd got big. This is the Women's March. <laughs> this day, Boston got to show to the world what it really values, what's its core values, what we really celebrate. It was such a great opportunity. And at the end of the day, the park was absolutely spotless. There was no mess left. What we said is that we really care about our public spaces and we want to make sure that they're protected and that these are the places that we celebrate. We celebrate our differences, we celebrate what we care about, but we already, we already cherish our green spaces. The master plan, which will be ably guided by Weston and Sampson, will help the city, the friends of the public garden, and the community decide the kind of park we want Boston Common to be. The park is not a blank slate. It is a living, historical landscape. As a landmark, it needs to be treated with the solemnity afforded to the important monuments it holds. And I don't think there's a monument in Boston Common that says more about our principles than the Shaw 54th. Concurrent with this plan, the restoration of the 54th highlights the extraordinary power of collaboration. If the city is able to acquiesce even just a little bit of control, and we are willing, and we are able, the results are amazing. A partnership with National Parks, Friends of the Public Garden, City of Boston, and the Museum of African American History is going to transform what is arguably one of the most important pieces of art in our entire country. And it also is so symbolic of the values we hold as Bostonians. This is a shining example of the potential of the master plan. Not only will we be guiding $23 million of investment, but if we do it right, we will also be creating opportunities to have catalyst projects that further attract philanthropic support. This is the power of public monuments, to quote Liz. I do say that on July 10th, we'll have to get our comms plan in place so when people see us taking this thing down, they don't think we're taking it out of the comms. <laughs> 
we're taking it out just to make sure that it's fixed. But we have to remember that with all the seriousness that we approach the master plan with, we have to remember that it's also just a great place of whimsy. It's a great place of fun. It's the place where magic happens. I mean, it's not just about all the proposals and how beautiful those are. And I'm sure that 100% of all marriages survive if you get, you know, if you, if you propose here. I don't know what the, the rate, the divorce rate is like zero if you propose here. It's enough magic to keep you going the whole time. But that's Boston Common too. Boston Common is also the place where magic happens. And yet the frog pot's falling apart. It's hard to keep the water uh, going in the summer, and it's hard to keep the ice cold in the winter. And the frog pond has to be re-engineered, it has to be redesigned, it has to be rethought. It has to be historically appropriate, and it has to be the right scale and scope. But it's time. It's run at the end of its life cycle. This is very, very difficult work. And then, of course, as we look at the events, there are so many events that we, we are just it's impossible to imagine the common without some of these events, and yet some of them probably should go. There's too many events on Boston Common. They're too big. How are we going to deal with that? We're going to deal with that by building big, bold, beautiful public spaces in the city. Even though we have a 10-minute walk for all of our residents, we still need more. We have to create more livability. So there has to be major event space in the city to take some of the pressures off Boston Common. And we have to be judicious about the events that we program into this park. We have to make sure that there's a maintenance and operations plan associated with them. They can't just come in and trash the park. You know, I was joking about the Patriots Parade, but it still looks bad. You know, we have to wait till spring to fix it. There should be a plan in place before a major event like that to try to mitigate some of those circumstances. So we need to think about things like that. And we need to think about these competing interests. And we need to use these opportunities to make them into collaborative challenges. And so what I would, I would name to you is one of the big challenges that we'll be coming up with our master plan is the MLK Memorial itself. You know, as you look at the MLK Memorial and the addition of a major piece of statuary into the park, first off, we're incredibly honored to, to honor America's greatest civil rights advocate in the park. Yet, we still have to make sure that the park's working. We have to make sure that we have enough green space. We have to make sure it happens at the right scale and scope. So we look forward to working with the ML Committee uh, and with the Landmarks Commission, as well as with the Arts Commission, to creating a project that can come from concept to a permanent project, and one that works for the park. I also want to recognize um, the importance of the MOA. And this is where I'll end. The importance of the MOA isn't because Liz and Leslie and I don't trust each other. It's because, I mean, it's a little bit of that, but, you know, um, <laughs> but that's healthy. Um, it's because there is a future where there's a different Parks Commissioner. There's a future where there's a different Friends of the Public Garden. And what you would never want to do is you would never want to let powerful personalities down the road derail the decades worth of work of the Friends. Exactly. The reason the Boston Common has been protected is because of the Friends of the Public Garden. And guess what? You were all the friends of the public garden long before 49 years ago. People have been protecting this park for a long time, and we'll need to keep protecting this park. Again, we're in sort of a golden age of park advocacy, where people are striving for big, really expensive urban spaces and redesigning spaces. But even now, in this current climate, in this golden age, you look around the, the country, and even internationally, and there are examples of park spaces they're disappearing. Now, I'm not an official in these cities, but I would just say this is, this is a word of caution. When you hear about the Obama Museum in Chicago and where it's going in park and some of the conflicts that might be happening there, you have to stop and really consider what's happening there. Again, I don't know the details. I'm not an official of that park. But that's something that gives you pause. You know, what if we put a major museum into Boston Common? took up some park space to do that. 
That'd be a tough decision to make. You hear about something like the Elizabeth Street Gardens. Uh, we were just we were just graced at the Trustees of Reservation annual gardeners gathering by the New York um, Community Gardens advocacy, advocacy. And they were telling us that the Elizabeth Street Gardens in Manhattan is disappearing for affordable housing. And listen, there's no more expensive place to live than the city of Boston. We're very blessed because our housing director, Sheila Dillon, is the biggest tree hugger I know. <laughs> so she's fighting out there for the community gardens. But again, strong personalities can change. And this morning in London, I read an article where there was a housing development where kids who lived in the public housing played in one playground, and then there was a hedge, and then the kids who lived in the private residences played in another playground. And that's in London. That's a major metropolitan city. So there are still threats to parks advocacy, and you have to stay vigilant. I'm just really grateful uh, for the opportunity to talk to you. I'm really grateful to work on the master plan with you, and I'll answer as many questions as appropriate. Thank you very much. some questions. We will have time to uh, have a reception afterwards, maybe four or five questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have a map that can show exactly where the MLK memorial is going to be in relation to the State House on that? I, I don't have a map, but I can tell you in general where they're hoping it will be. But I, what I gotta say is they still gotta get through parks. I, I, I shouldn't say they should. They still have to collaborate with parks. <laughs> they still have to collaborate uh, with the landmarks commission. We're, we're, don't get me wrong. We're really excited about this project, right? I mean, you know, Boston has a long history um, uh, of racial device, divisiveness. We have the NAACP conference coming to the city of Boston. That's a major accomplishment. That means attitudes are changing about our city. But we still got a lot of work to do. And I think, I think a monument like this would really set the tone about things that we believe in. That being said, uh, the place that they're hoping it would go is nearer to the Parkman bandstand in one of the panels, I think, that currently is, is the rotating off-leash dog program. Uh, but we'll have to work with them on that. Yes? Sure. So it, it, it depends on whether or not you're an inland park like Boston Common, although if you, you know, if we don't do anything, it's the Shawmut Peninsula. Boston Common's going to be on the waterfront pretty quick. Um, but uh, on the water, uh, it's mostly uh, berming up towards the edge to deal with uh, sea level rise. So by 2070, we're looking at 40 inches of sea level rise in Boston. Uh, some of you may may know this, the Northeast is going to feel the effects of sea level rise more than other regions in the country. It's just, you know, it's, it has to do with some of the, the expanded thermal expansion we might be getting of the water. What's scary about that is that you say, well, 40 inches of sea level rise, I could just build a, a little seawall on the edge. It doesn't account for the wave action and the inundation that we've received in something like a 1% storm. And so that's where you have to really create uh, almost a sponge park and an opportunity for something that can get really, really soaked and then drain and drain in a way that it doesn't flood backwards into the neighborhoods. And so some of that in some places like the Four Point Channel, it's going to be really hard engineering where it's landscaped over like a concrete uh, wall and then you would put a green berm over that and there would be a lot of traditional uh, outflow pipes and things like that to pump out and to drain. Um, in places like Mowgli, you can go for a much more natural solution if you connect the beach to the actual park and let nature do its thing. Inland is the more interesting challenge. As you look at a place like Boston Common and all the development that's happening around Boston Common, <coughs> stormwater management is going to be incredibly complicated moving into the future. We're going to have higher and higher precipitation events, which means that we're going to get a lot of rain in a very short period of time. And anyone who drives around the city knows, like especially in places like the South End and Lower Roxbury, we really struggle with that today. So I think as we look at Boston Common, especially with the master plan, I think there's a lot of engineering that's going to have to take place with the Water and Sewer Commission. Yes. You mentioned that at the Women's March there was no litter, yeah. but at the Hempfest 
Yeah. Tons of litter. So, is there an educational plan so that when the hemp fest starts, they say to everybody, this is historic landmark land, and please take your litter with you? So and they just let people know. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't think we've been as aggressive with it as we probably could have. So the comment there was, you know, at the Women's March, there wasn't any litter at the end of it, but at the hemp fest, the, the park was... Uh, you know, not destroyed is too strong a term, but you know, the park was trashed. You know, it took three days for us to clean the park. Um, I will say, we've been really aggressive with the organizers, and that's been part of the problem in our strategy. I don't think we have done a public outreach uh, campaign to the people who actually show up and take part in the festival. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. Uh, we do have these A-frame signs that we typically use for no smoking and uh, to keep dogs on leash except in the designated areas. Maybe there's an opportunity to do something like that and just really appeal to the better angels of people's nature. Yes? Are we going to be able to move some of these events to the old plaza? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm looking at the new City Hall Plaza designs and the event space is, is, is not as big as one would hope. Um, it's still pretty significant. I mean, they can still definitely get 5, 10,000, 15,000 people there. But I think we're going to need major event space in the City of Boston. That's why I'm excited about some of the work that uh, the Trustees of Reservations is talking about on the waterfront. Um, but I think we need, I, I think we need designated major event space in the city of Boston. Something has to move, something has to give. You know, it's hard to make grass grow if there's 10,000 people on it. <laughs> yes? Which events would you leave open? Which hmm? events are you well, That's a great question, Adam. So the question was, uh, which events would we think about moving? And that would have to be part of, you know, an equitable public discussion, right? Again, what do we value as a community? What are the things that we can't live without? Is it fair that some rotate in and out? I mean, is that just the way you do it? I mean, there are times where the Central Park Conservancy shuts down the Great Lawn. And, the, you know, it's, I'm sure Boston Commons grass is just as deserving of that treatment. We don't have a, an opportunity to really unplug and really plan the park very often. It would be a mistake to not look at the events and their management as part of the master plan process. Right. So we've allocated uh, roughly, and I'm going to get the number wrong, but hundreds of thousands of dollars to some design, conceptual designs of it. Um, as far as actual capital dollars to construct it, no, we haven't allocated that. So that would be part of the process that we would engage with the friends is, is there some amount that we would dedicate from the master plan money to the um, the develop the further development of those designs from concept to actual like something like design documents that you might be able to bid and then can we look for philanthropic support because I do think that's the kind of amenity that would attract investment um, but again it would have to be something that the people feel really good about let's have one more question there is oh I apologize there is oddly enough uh, a lot of annual money uh, dedicated to the frog pond because it's so expensive to run. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, sir. No, it's not low on the priority list. You know, those are those are actually um, some of our most used tennis courts that we have in the entire city of Boston. Um, I don't know if it's because of the location, or just because there's not a lot of other tennis courts in downtown Boston. Um, but they desperately need to be fixed. Now, whether or not they need to be moved. No, no, keep where they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the problem. When, when everything's on the table, everything's on the table, you know? Um, I, I don't envision a future where there's not a tennis court out there. However, is there a way to design that the tennis courts can also be flexible space to be used for something? We should definitely make at least portions of the tennis courts permeable just from a stormwater management. You know, so you know, maybe you keep the center court for the, the playability, but then the edges, um, the water can drain so it doesn't pool. A lot of that cracking 
is because the water just sits there for so long and then it, you know, it cracks like a driveway. Um, but those are very well loved and well used tennis courts. I will say along those lines, you know, when you start looking at the amount of space that the baseball, the softball fields take up, and you think about like who really uses those fields, you know, it's it's like you know, Spruce Street Daycare and other groups and things like that. You know, is there an opportunity to make that more of a multi-purpose field while also serving softball? I think those are the things that we we have to look at. And I and I think also the update of the lighting. I mean, the poor people who live around the common, like half the time the light's shining right into their bedrooms. You know, they're, they're, the the lighting systems for sports lighting have just been have become so advanced now that you can really just focus it on the one space. And I, I think we can make a more livable city, a prettier city, while also keeping active recreation at the core of the common. I think. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> There was a lot of uh, food for thought, and it was really wonderful, very provocative. And we hope you will all stay for reception for food and drink and conversation. Thank you so much for coming.